Hello, this is Professor Lusheen, and this is the supplemental video to Module 3. As you can see on the screen right now, I'm going to try to cover uh, updates or, or additional information for lectures 11, 12, and 14. What I'd like to do is, uh, under Lecture 11, I do give you a tour of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but I just want to go back there because maybe the, it isn't fully the same way. So here's the, the front page of it. To get to the safety or to the uh, injury and illness data, you go, you just put the, the cursor over subjects, it opens up, and then in the center at the bottom it says workplace injuries. Click on that and that brings us to injury, illness, and fatalities. I did provide you with the 2015 uh, SOI and S is CFOI reports, and you can get to them through here. You hit national data or over national data and click on non fatal, and these, this is going to be the SOI reports. And look, it goes back all the way to 1994. I provided the summary and also the charts. That's, that's what I used for the, uh, the PowerPoint. You can also get the, uh, the census of fatal injury and illnesses, um, and it's got pretty much the same setup here. But for your final exam, you're going to want to play around here. So I, I recommend go here, just kind of look around to see what kind of data they have. I mean, just right there on the home page, they've got information over here from the most recent report, which they're reporting their 2015 numbers. Usually around December of each year, they give the previous years. So in December of 2017, we'll get the 2016 numbers. That's approximately how it works, but I think right here, they say maybe November. But um, that's usually pushed back. So that's the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. Just wanted to bring you back to it and definitely go play there. The next thing is I want to kind of show you a side-by-side -side comparison. In the original Lecture 11 video, I believe I expressed the 2013 data, um, or it could be 2014, but 2013 is what I found on the PowerPoint, so I wanted to update it. So let's do a comparison. Uh, whenever you see red, that is an indication there's been an increase. So this is fatal. This is uh, deaths at work. Um, so the total number of fatalities have gone up by 250 from 2013 to uh, uh, 2015. Now if we, when we look at the rates we're going to find it's fairly even but it did, we did you know 251 more people died between 2013 and 2015. Roadway accidents which is the number one cause of death in the workplace or on the job I should say did go up by 165 which is the lion's share of the overall total. Slips, trips, and falls went up by 76 um, and that's usually the second highest. And then homicides. Homicides and struck by kind of flip as far as third, but here it looks like it's still third. And it did go up by 13. So you can kind of see with the increase of 251, roadway accidents were the number one cause. Here is a breakdown of the rates. So from 2013 to 2015, it did go up to 3.4 fatalities per 100,000 full-time equivalent workers. That's FTEs. That's a, that's a concept you need to know. But in here, it breaks it off by um, by self-employed workers versus others. And you can see their rate is a little bit higher, um, and that may account for some of the increase. But it's such a small percent of the overall workforce that it doesn't have a lot of influence. Here's by uh, major event. As you can see, transportation incidents are number one. Slip trips and falls are number two. Contact with object looks to be number three. I had, I had indicated that just a moment ago. And violence is fourth. Exposure to harmful substances is, is uh, fifth. And fires and explosions, sixth. And you can kind of see the comparison between them. Here is by industry. Construction, more people die in the construction industry or doing construction work. However, look at the rate of it. Again, that's the rate per 100,000 FTEs. That actually would make it fourth. So the greatest rate is agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting. The second is transportation warehousing. So that's second for total number and second for rate. And then when we come down here, mining, quarry, and oil and gas extraction has 120, but from a rate perspective, it's 11.4, um, which is third. I like to use the rates as a better indicator of whether which industries are most severe because it, it takes into account the number of people. So what I, what the way and the way I equate that, and you could probably you know look at my incidence rate uh, videos in lecture 12, but it's for the number of exposures. So I'm kind of saying the number of hours worked by workers um, versus how many outcomes are negative. So it's a rate thing. So the greater chance, you can call it that, or greater probability of injury um, versus not. And so that's, that's a nice breakdown. I, that's why I like to use rates over total counts. Here's the total counts, though, by state. Here's Wisconsin. 
you know, our, our neighboring state, Minnesota, we have a lot of similarities and we have similar industries and we're hurting people or we're killing people in Wisconsin at a greater um, count than Minnesota. And this is just an overall interesting breakdown of the United States. Let's compare now non-fatal injury and illnesses. So these, these are people who got hurt at work and um, either lost time or came back under a restriction, uh, a work restriction or limitation of, of, of movement uh, or lifting, whatever it might be, sorry, or at least they received more than first aid. And that's something we cover in Lecture 12. So from 2013, it has gone down. The actual number has gone down. Now, this isn't all-encompassing. This is a sample survey that Bureau of Labor Statistics conducts, and then they extrapolate. So they have a statistically significant representation, and then they extrapolate. So this isn't, you know, exact numbers. It's estimations. So it, the overall has gone down by a little over 100,000. The cases involving days away from work. So these are people who, the day after they get hurt, they have to stay home and recover. They cannot come back to work. That's gone down by almost 15,000 cases. The median days away from work tends to still be about eight. So if somebody does, if somebody does have to stay home and recover, uh, and this is calendar days, so it includes weekends as well. It takes them about eight days to get back in full strength, or eight days just to get back in limited duty as well. Cases involving sprains and strains tends to be our number one. You know, overexertion is our number one. And um, it's gone down just slightly, though. A small amount. I guess when you look up here, it's point something, and here it's, yeah, so it's slight. The injuries to the back could be a sprain and strain as well, but we're bringing it more specific back tends to be the most primary um, lifting injury related and uh, that didn't sound right but you know what I mean so that went down a, you know a considerable about more than the sprains and strains did and in case involving slip strips and falls it actually had gone up from 2013 so out of all the non-fatals slip strips and falls is the only one that's really gone up probably something that could be on a quiz <laughs> hint hint uh, here's the overall total case incidence rate dart rate um, and you can see that over time, it, it's dipped down. It's the lowest it's ever been. And actually, what's interesting is 2015, we've had the, you know, the unemployment rate has been going down. So we have more people in the workplace. So from a total case incidence rate perspective, things appear to be getting safer. And that's what the number showed up. Now, in December, when we get the 2016, where the uh, unemployment rate has gone down even more, we'll see what happens. But as you can see, as we've gone since 2013, it's always at least gone down or stayed the same. So I'm wondering when this may come back up. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, as far as why did it go down, uh, looks like this starred one, the other recordable cases has gone down, uh, whereas uh, job transfer cases has been consistent over time. We've had a slight dip in our days away. Um, DART has gone down a little bit. So the biggest reduction are the other recordable cases. So uh, case injury cases which are recordable that result in lost time, either they have to stay home or not, uh, those tend to not be changing much. It's the ones that are first aid or whatever tend to be going down, which from a work comp perspective, it doesn't, is, isn't good. You know, we want to control more of the lost time ones. Here's a breakdown of incidence rates. For uh, these are the non-fatals again. We had just looked at the uh, the fatal stuff. So from a rate perspective, and this rates, let's see, what does it say? The, oh, these are the number of cases. Thousand. This is the incidence rate over here. Highest incidence rate is agricultural, forestry, fishing, and hunting. Where have we seen that before? So compare that back to the fatality. But the total number is a little bit lower. The highest number, healthcare and social assistance, and they're third on incidence rate. Second for total is manufacturing, and there's their total. It's just above the overall average. And you can look at the rest. Where is construction? Construction is right here. 3.4 incidence rate, and about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, fifth, fifth in the total number of non-fatal. So you see some similarities between this data and the uh, fatality data. This is a uh, uh, study sheet question. Which size of company has the greatest number? It's this 50 to 249. My hypothesis for this is that it's when companies are growing and they get into this range where down here they probably don't have a safety professional working there. They probably use consultants or the work comp carriers lost control. Over here, though, they're starting to get so large that um, you need you need systems to help 
um, with communication because there's so many employees. Whereas down here, you, get, you all see each other mostly. But here you need a, a, an increased level of integration within an organization. And this is where you may not have a full-time safety professional yet. And so they're experiencing the most. As you get a 250 and above, you better have at least one safety professional on site at all times, if not more. So you're kind of seeing the, the reward here. And then it gets up to 1,000. You know, these are probably statistically the same here between that and that. Here is the difference between um, private industry, state government, and local government. I think I do cover this stuff in my lectures, but you can see here in 2015, we're seeing a fairly consistent uh, 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 ratio here between these three groups. And here are the states. Look at Wisconsin. It's just a tick higher than Minnesota, yet we had so many more fatalities. And I wonder what that means. have to dig into the data to see what it means. All right, so that's the end of the updates on the uh, BLS data. I want you to watch uh, in Lecture 12 uh, a webinar I put together in, the, um, in February on the new record keeping and reporting requirements for OSHA. And I'm just going to do a quick, this is where it is on the website and on our D2L I do have links. But let me just show you a few extra things that have changed. So this is where the supplemental video will be. I already have the uh, uh, PowerPoint posted. Here are the updated 2015 reports and charts for you. There's a study sheet. And uh, I closed that one. That's, that's an old video, so you don't have to watch that. Lecture 12 is the OSHA record keeping, so I'm kind of adding to that right now. Uh, here's the link to the webinar I just showed you on YouTube. Here's the compliance bulletin I just received. I'll be talking about that in just a moment. I also added a form I created when I was in graduate school. And for any HR people, you may want to download this and keep it. You just have to add in your company's information. But what I did is I created a, um, an, a kind of self-updating and prioritizing uh, OSHA 200, 300 log where you can enter information here. You just have to go down. This, this, these entries here are all uh, state of Wisconsin work comp codes. You enter in information. It's got drop-down windows, which is really cool. So there isn't, you know, non-standardization of entries. But in the second tab, this automatically updates your 300A, which you can then just, you know, have an executive, you know, sign and date, and you can post it February 1st to April 30th. But on the back side here, it's a real-time update of the high prioritized jobs, and you would have to update this with your company's job information. So I've had a lot of, I teach this in my, my advanced class, and my students tend to um, like it. So lecture 13, I don't believe I added much new information here. Work comp hasn't changed a lot. There's been a few changes to the laws, but you don't have to know that. You just have to know the gist of what it is. For the inspection, I'm going to be going over my, a more recent audit and some of the reports for you and the video kind of takes you through some as well and I may post some additional videos but I think that might be too much I just want you to get you familiar with auditing and inspections and there hasn't really been any changes to lecture 15 so let's get back to the presentation here so I just want to talk real quick I just received this a few minutes before I recorded this and I did post I pointed it out that although July 1st of this year uh, larger companies and companies in high hazard industries, I think it's maybe just the larger companies, 250 employees or more, have to are supposed to electronically submit their 300A reports to OSHA. OSHA has just stated that they're not going to be ready to accept anything, even though they haven't officially changed that due date. And so what the you can, you can read the bulletin. It basically says, keep saving your data, but you're probably not going to be submitting it. That's me laughing because I predicted this back in January. <laughs> okay. So uh, I per, I'm going to leave an older video in which I go over some work I had done back in 2008, I believe. But I, I want to do a new one because I just did some work about a year ago. And I'm kind of proud of it, so I want to share that with you. So these are the three documents that I have for you to take a look at. Uh, let's start with the results. So, oh, this was oh this was 2015. Wow, it was over a year ago. I didn't realize. So I took the name of the company off of here. It's, it's a local company, but I want to show you how I go through to do an audit. So just like an OSHA inspection we covered in Module 2, I can attract to see how many people work there and what is their North American Industrial Classification Code and compare it to their BLS rates. This is all stuff you should be doing uh, if you're out assessing or auditing a company and their safety program. 
So I estimated their incidence rates versus industry, and they're higher. So that's a red flag, like I said, for OSHA. Here's a breakdown of their records for five years. You can see what the overall numbers are. So as you learn about the OSHA log, you can see here I've got, I believe this is columns H, I, J. Yeah, that's correct. And that's uh, H, I, J, K, and L are right here. And I, this is just a sum of these three. I got some of the causes here. I got some of their work comp data as well. You can see. Reviewed the programs they currently have in place. Identify some deficiencies. And then this is the walk around. If you remember from uh, module two, the walk around is sort of the, the bones of the of the inspection. And I always take pictures of things that I want to talk about. And so I'm also citing the OSHA standard. Uh, on, the, on the violations I'm finding. And of course, when I used this presentation, I was presenting to management. But for you, I'm kind of just showing you more of the methods. See, why did I take this picture? Well, they're just dropping a circular saw. Well, it looks like that strain relief is broken too. I should have pointed that out. But they're just dropping it. And it's the, the, the electrical cord is sometimes contacting the blade itself. And, so, and it doesn't stop immediately. And look at here, I found that it happened before, and there's damage. So that, that's a possible fire hazard because it could arc and, or spark and cause some of the sawdust to catch fire, but it could also electrocute somebody. And also, you've got to pay to replace it. I f saw, I observed in real time, this piece that had leaning up against here fall to here. And this was the guy who had just moved out of the way. He would have been hit. See, it's still right here. Um, you've got to secure storage. Otherwise, you, there'd be a contact struck by accident. This is what they rely on. This latch is, is busted. People walk under this suspended load. You can't do that. And here I explain, you can't do that. I, when talking to the workers, I was watching their methods, and it looked like if they didn't hit the, the stud, uh, the wall set, as they were using their nail guns, it's possible something could go through and hit. And indeed, they confirmed that. I said, you got to do something about that. Uh, they're not working above the four feet that general industry requires for fall protection or railings, but falling from 36 inches could still hurt you. And so I, I, we, I recommended that they have to investigate something. I looked at their first aid kit. Um, their eye wash doesn't meet the OSHA standard. Also, it was interesting when I asked about, are people, you know, missing the studs and, and getting nails in their hands? Like, no, I don't think so. But see this um, can right here? This is a, a can of uh, spray septic. Um, there's blood on it. So I said, well, somebody's getting cut. And then they've got this oxygen tank that is actually partially empty. And oxygen is a fire accelerant. I said, just get this out of here. I don't see any need for it. So they've got uh, liquid petroleum tanks stored outside. This is for their fork trucks. Doesn't have any labeling. Got to have labeling. That's required. I've got it right there. Here they've got uh, st overhead storage. You got to have a, uh, a placard that, that provides a weight rating for something like that. An engineer can easily do that. They got a blocked electrical panel. Cited that. They had a couple of them. Excuse me. Here they're not using electrical correctly. Um, Oh, and I should have, when we get to electrical issues, I have a picture that a friend just posted on Facebook. There's a fire in her house that she plugged in a dehumidifier and a light into an, uh, an extension cord multi alert just like this, and it started on fire. It melted and sparked, and arced, excuse me. So you can't do that. These, have, these things have to be plugged directly into the wall because wall circuits are capable of, um, of circuit breaking if you um, draw too much amps through it. Whereas this device here doesn't know. It doesn't know. It, it would just, it would heat up if you overdraw. Non-compliant gas can. It's going to come up, you know, throughout this class. People always use plastic ones in the workplace. You can't. You can use them at home. I don't care. Hascom we'll talk about in Module 5, but if you can't just have stuff just all over the place, you got to have it organized or properly, and they didn't have a program. There's also a lot of noise, and my students actually came in and did some noise monitoring for them. They have a dust collection system. It's homemade, but when you've got this much buildup here, there's a leak. They didn't know, and so me finding this, they were able to fix it because you don't want that much of a buildup of dust. I don't have the videos activated, but they do have upcut up saws, which this thing comes down and locks onto the piece you're going to cut, and then this saw blade comes up out of the table and cuts it, and it's basically inches from their fingers. And I said, this is dangerous. And we found out that somebody had actually lost some digits because of this. They just hadn't guarded it yet. But an update, they did guard it. Here, this isn't guarded at all. Um, and I gave them some recommendations later. This And the same with the radial arm saw. I had a student go back 
um, and check this stuff out for me last fall. And they have guarded all of the equipment. And here I gave them some recommendations. So that was my summary, and I closed it. So let's, uh, I'm going to show you really quickly the report that I gave them. So you can kind of see what it looks like. It's just sort of a longer version of the PowerPoint that I gave. So I was given an executive summary of everything. And so what I did is I did a full mock OSHA audit, and I cited them for penalties, 20 violations, uh, totaling 34, a little over $34,000. This is the old system, too. This is when the max penalty was 7 and 70. So it would be up, you know, by, by a considerable amount. Um, the, this is with the initial penalty, but with reductions. And I actually gave them penalty reductions, and I'll show that. Um, so then I talked about the scope, the justification for it. Uh, see, I've got the, uh, the data analysis in comparison to peers. I've got the review of the written program that they had, and then I get into the visual inspection. And there's a little bit more here, because I really want, I, in the report, it's easier to provide more. And you can see more of the workplace there. Um, action photos, and you guys saw these. And I'm just going to get past. This are all the results, and I'm, I label everything. Uh, so in, in uh, Module 2, I talked about the um, Field Operations Manual, and that's what this is from. Uh, but it's the old version. I think uh, 0200160, I think, is the new one, if I'm not mistaken. But this stuff is fairly similar, and I did the same rating system for what I found. As you can see, here's an example. I gave them a total of 50%, so they got 40 for size. Actually, this is 70 now, isn't it? Right. And it should equal out to, I think this is down to 25 now. I think that's the change. Well, they didn't have anything really in place, so I gave them a zero for that. Uh, I think this is 26 to 50 now. I think they still would get, maybe it's different. Maybe it's a little to look. But they don't have any history with OSHA that's bad, so they still got the 10%. Here's a breakdown. Here's my table. The citation number that I gave, that I generated, what type of gravity it had. I did group these two and gave the severity and probability and the penalty associated with it based on the field operations manual. Here's the unadjusted penalty of the initial with the 50% reduction. That would be their total assessment if they were to receive the citation package. Then I get into some recommendations and I had a bunch of student groups come in and do some additional auditing and assessment for them and build some programs for them. Created an orientation video, uh, wrote a program, did some noise monitoring, and started a HASCOM program for them. I gave them some information from the OSHA website. I always do that for customers. Kind of gives them something to focus on, what they need to do. And then we got to the appendices, and I don't have them here. But samples of it I've provided to you. The last thing I want to show you, and I, I know I'm running out of time, I apologize, is I, I simulated the citation and notification of penalty. Because uh, so, I held a real closing conference with them. And so it has all the rights and responsibilities, the right to contest and everything, just to educate them in case OSHA ever came by. And I think the OSHA inspectors would think this is pretty cool, too. So I customized it to my consulting business. And this is what a citation looks like. And this is something you should have looked at, become familiar with in Module 2. you know. And they actually took these abatement dates serious and tried to follow through. I haven't gone back to verify yet, but we have been in discussion about bringing in some students to do a verification study. So um, all these individual ones, and they're and I posted this for you, so you can actually look at this. I'm just going to get to the last page. Man, this is long. Somebody put in a lot of work. <laughs> I did. And get to the invoice. So here's the final page here. So I've got the citations, the serious, non-serious, the, uh, the unadjusted amount, the rate, and there it is. And that's what a citation package looks like. So I uh, want to thank you for watching this Module 3 um, update and seeing the updates. And so contact me if you have any questions.